welcome, bud. Glad um, to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, what we're going to do, and, and first of all, thank you for your service. Um, what we're going to do really is, is pretty much start at the beginning, where you were born, how you got into the service, and I know you've got some interesting stories about a great-grandfather, so I think you've got some history there. Well, thanks for the invitation, no, and uh, thanks for uh, asking me in. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to go back and revisit former times. Uh, Hopefully were, not too painful <laughs> they were, process. Uh, they were rather intense at, at mm -hmm. uh, certain portions. But to, to answer your question, I was born the youngest of eight children in uh, okay. Neshoba County, Mississippi, to a, to a cotton farmer. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of those siblings are now gone, and I'm the only one remaining. And mother right. and father have been long gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, raised in Mississippi. On, on this cotton farm, and yes, I have picked cotton, <laughs> and uh, uh, went away to uh, uh, school for a while, and then uh, decided that uh, in, in 1963 uh, that I would uh, uh, fulfill a, a boyhood dream of joining the United States Marine Corps. Okay. And uh, I joined the Marine Corps, uh, uh, went away to boot camp in San Diego, California, um, uh, was uh, was uh, graduated from boot camp, went into the infantry, and uh, was, uh, was assigned to the third battalion, first Marines, first Marine division in 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 uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Now, when you went off, let me interrupt a little mm -hmm. a second here. When you went off to California, had you been out of the state of Mississippi? I mean, had you traveled? Not much. much. Not much. <laughs> I yeah. was homegrown and. Uh, and uh, I, I, I knew that there was a world outside of Mississippi. And my father once said, but be careful of that world outside, son. There are Yankees up there. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and ironically, later on, I find myself marrying a Yankee to, okay. my, to my credit and I hope my wife's. But um, I, our company uh, and our unit trained for two very hard years mm -hmm. uh, in Camp Pendleton, California. So uh, by the time we received... Uh, orders to go other places. We were a, a well-trained, almost, in fact, a veteran unit. Uh, it was a, an infantry company, a Marine infantry company is, is uh, four platoons, 50 mm -hmm. men to a platoon, and then there's a weapons platoon of 50 men. Hmm. Weapons platoon consists of uh, machine guns and rocket launchers. I was in the weapons platoon and I was a machine gun squad leader. So was that by choice or you were just selected for that? Selected for Select. it. Okay. And, um, uh, and I was, I was made a, a private first class out of recruit training, one of four men in the unit. And uh, so that put me uh, at, a, at an advantage for early promotion once I got to the, to, to the, uh, to the field, as we say. But uh, in, in um, May of, of 1965, uh, the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, was gathered on, on a parade deck in, at Camp Pendleton, California. We were all gathered there by the, by the lieutenant colonel commanding uh, this, this brigade. And he said, uh, gentlemen, we are uh, about ready to go to Vietnam. And we all uh, had heard of some place called Vietnam. Now, keep mm -hmm. in mind, this was in... May of, of 1965. How old, were you? How old were you at this time? How old was I? I was 20 years 20? old. Okay. 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, <laughs> how old was I? I aged very quickly once it got underway. Uh, but we all rather looked at each other, but uh, it, it, he said we'll be entering combat service in Vietnam in support of the Vietnamese people who are under uh, communist threat. And uh, this was all quite a lot to take for young American men, uh, but this is for what we were trained. We knew nothing about the political situation. We were not mm -hmm. political sophisticates, believe me. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just were young Marines and, and we're now receiving uh, strat uh, stratospheric orders to go someplace else mm -hmm. and perhaps engage in combat. So we, uh, in short order, were loaded up on ships uh, in San Diego, amphibious uh, troop carrying ships. Uh, and we were, our battalion was loaded on one ship, and it, we went to Okinawa, where we received additional training in, mm -hmm. in the northern training area of Okinawa in jungle warfare. 
And uh, then in uh, June of 1965, we were loaded up again on troop ships and uh, were ordered to go to Vietnam. As we approached Vietnam, we received a briefing by our company commander that we were going to uh, operationally be involved in security uh, of, of the uh, Da Nang Air Base mm -hmm. in Da Nang. And we were, we were told that our role simply was to defend and support the Vietnamese military, uh, that we were not to engage ourselves in offensive warfare. We were being informed this on a ship, but we, we were there as a, like a security force or protective force which lasted all of about two weeks, by the way. So we get to Vietnam. We're placed in, in, uh, in uh, trenches. It did not escape our attention that the trenches had been built a long time ago. And the Brent, uh, we slipped into trenches that were built by the French. Sure, because the French were there in the late 50s, if I'm remembering You're, history. You remember any exactly yeah, correctly. 56, 57, somewhere in there. And we also mm -hmm. were mindful that they had been defeated mm -hmm. by the same people now that were in opposition to us, the North Vietnamese and the local indigenous military, uh, the Viet Cong. So we were in French trenches uh, uh, with our machine guns in French bunkers. And, uh, and that, that and we were aware, of course, had been told that the mm -hmm. French were defeated by these same people. Mm -hmm. But it didn't, that, didn't, <laughs> that didn't bother us at all. I mean, we, we, we felt that whatever the French lost, we would win back. Sure, uh, that's, of course. That's exactly the way we felt about it, not, not a cast any aspersions on the French. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, uh, very shortly thereafter, our mission changed, and it, it was it was a it was like almost overnight. It was it was quite clear that the local uh, uh, South Vietnamese military, uh, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, mm -hmm. Arvins, uh, that they uh, needed some direct operational support, uh, and because they were not they were winning nothing, and they mm -hmm. were losing everything sure. to the the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese and. So then we became involved in what was called search and destroy missions. We would be sent out uh, in, in platoon and company size. Uh, we would be sent out to engage, uh, locate the enemy, search the enemy, and once we found him, to destroy the enemy. And that, that became, that was the nub of the problem right away because where is the enemy to be found? The enemy mm -hmm. is to be found uh, in 1965, living amongst the Vietnamese sure. people, and they they're living in the villages. And so when we search out uh, and destroy, uh, it follows necessarily that you're going into a village with heavy armament, uh, and that your 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 goal is to locate the enemy and destroy him. And a lot of times, that enemy were the sons and husbands and brothers of the civilians who lived in that village. So you can see mm -hmm. the horns of our dilemma, mm -hmm. our strategic and tactical dilemma. You could see it right away because we were, we were necessarily, uh, and, and, and this is my first inkling that something was wrong with this mission. Something was terribly wrong with our mission. If, mm -hmm. if, if our goal is to go in and destroy the enemy, uh, then we have to have the ability to do that. And it was clear that the enemy, in many cases, was synonymous with the local indigenous population. Mm -hmm. They would farm during the day and pick up weapons at night right. and attack us at night. So, and I can, I can recall uh, very quickly that a, a sister company to ours uh, got on uh, amphibious tractors, went down a river, uh, offloaded uh, at a village called Camney. Camney Cam mm -hmm. was a village complex, there were four villages within that complex mm -hmm. and as they went into that village they took heavy fire Cam Ni, uh probably 30 miles southwest of Da Nang and as they took fire they rushed towards the village and several Marines were killed a uh, half dozen were killed and several more were wounded by the forces that were in that village there was a tunnel complex in that village mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, fighting holes get in, automatic weapons fire, mortar fire, and it was a bloody operation. It was the first bloody operation in Vietnam. The first one where 
significant casualties occurred, the Battle of Camney in July of 1865. So there was, there was very little question that we, were, that we were going to visit that village again. There was very little question. And my company uh, was assigned that role of going to that village and searching and destroying the enemy located there. So we've got it. A fight has occurred there. Uh, American troops have been killed, uh, many wounded, and we're going back to that same village. Uh, this is uh, on April, August the 3rd of 1965, I less than uh, less than a month later. So we we were aware we were going and to... And you were a, private at this point. Uh, no, I was a corporal machine gun leader. Oh, so you're a corporal now. Machine okay. gun leader in charge of an M60 machine gun and four men. And so that was my role. And I was in support of uh, the way it works with weapons is a machine gun is with every platoon mm -hmm. and a rocket launcher is with every platoon. So if there are four platoons, there are four machine guns, or four rocket launchers, 3.5 mm -hmm. rocket launchers. So I, was, I supported the, the, uh, the, the fourth platoon over on the far right. We came down the river in amphibious tractors. We call them Amtraks, floating coffins they were because they, their gasoline, uh, uh, not to digress, but their gasoline mm -hmm. was carried underneath right up above the treads and when mm -hmm. they would hit mines, they would explode and, and the gas would explode and incinerate everybody inside or on top. So we didn't much like <laughs> the amphibious tractors, and, but we were on them going down this river. We curved out of the river and we went straight across this rice paddy and I was in the lead amphibious tractor, my gun, it was with elements of, of the 4th platoon, and we headed across this, and we were on top of the Amtraks, we weren't inside. Uh, as we went across, I could see a village complex with no people, no people, about 500 yards away. Mm -hmm. And as um, the Amtraks went and then turned, heavy treads, turning on a piece of high ground, slight piece of high ground, above a vast rice paddy of about 500 yards across to the east. And the sun is in our eyes. And we're looking across this, and the rest of the company comes out and off their Amtraks, and we're lined up in a company front. Company front. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> would it have not been better? And I'm a corporal, and I'm not in charge of this company. I'm not a captain in charge of this company. But would it have been better if we had taken the amphibious tractors and gone across the rice paddy and then unloaded? Mm -hmm. But I wasn't making that decision. And so as we start across with the order advance, uh, we started across this rice paddy. And the right flank, there's a term in the military called you're up in the air. The right flank the unit, I was in my right flank platoon was up in the air because we anchored to nobody on our right. Mm -hmm. we, we had a, nothing but a, a rice paddy, a continuation mm -hmm. of a rice paddy extending uh, uh, to, to the south. So I'm, I'm behind my machine gun and I'm on that same piece of high ground that we just departed because I'm surveying the scene and I'm mm -hmm. there with the, the, the platoon uh, commander, the lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And as we s just start across this, this rice paddy, the tree line to my right front, the tree line, dark jungle foliage, heavy vegetation, palm, uh, uh, just heavy ve vegetation, palm trees, and the like, that lit up with automatic weapons fire. And all of a sudden I hear this tinkling, and I'm wondering what the tinkling is. Well, I'm standing in a cemetery, a Vietnamese, civilian cemetery and the tinkling or the bullets hitting the tombstones. So I quickly realized that we were under very serious fire and one I might say that one of the proudest moments of my life was when that platoon without orders, without orders, knowing that the fire was coming from their right front, that platoon pivoted just like they were trained to do, pivoted and advanced to the fire. Fire teams advancing, two fire teams providing cover, fire teams advancing, my gun firing away over the tops of the troops, my gun into that tree line, but the tree line was hot. It was the company size mm -hmm. operation. Uh, you know, there was, there was 100 plus 
uh, soldiers of the enemy in that tree line at Viet Cong firing at us. And you could see the rooster tails flying up into the air as the bullets hit the water. Our men started to go down in that platoon, started to go down sink under the water. Others would pull them up, but the fire teams yet advanced. So we rushed that tree line and the enemy bolted back. We shot and killed several of them as they advanced to the rear. We didn't have any compunction about shooting them in the back, mm -hmm. none at all. Because they were shooting at us, sure. they were the enemy, and we shot and killed them. And as they raced out of that tree line, we then took over the tree line. And we were in the villages, and the other three platoons had advanced into the other villages. Kemney 1, 2, 3, and 4. We are already in the villages. And now, uh, this is when things get dicey. As we are in, we're, we're going through the village, and Viet Cong soldiers would pop up from behind us in fighting holes where bamboo mats had been placed over these fighting holes, and then they would shoot us in the back. And uh, this, it was clear to us, we dropped explosions, explosive devices into the holes, into the tunnel. But it was clear that these four villages, the four villages, which spread about five or six hundred yards uh, uh, along the edge of this, of, of this tree line, that these villages, it was very clear that they were all interconnected by a tunnel complex. You're trained uh, to advance to the fire, not to go the other way, <laughs> uh, which is called retreating. Yeah. <laughs> and so. We, we, we were advanced to the fire. And when I say I was proud, as, a, as, a, as a, an NCO subordinate commander, mm -hmm. uh, small unit, I was proud to see the troops do what they were trained to do, to your mm -hmm. point. They did exactly what they were trained to do without thinking about it. The value because of when the you're train. describing the tunnels mm -hmm. and the coming up behind mm -hmm. you and all of that, I'm wondering, whoa, I don't know how well, one prepares was, for that. But anyway. You know, how do you prepare for, for being disconcerted? Yeah. I don't know how you prepare for being mm -hmm. disconcerted. Okay. Your, your point's well taken. Okay. Um, and so uh, I, uh, my platoon commander, uh, we were advancing through the village, and I had a, the rockets leader supporting that platoon, his name was Barry Hanneth, he's a Lance Corporal from Brenham, Texas, and I was particularly fond of him. We are friends to this day. And he's a retired banker in Texas today. But uh, as we were advancing through the village, Barry is right in front of me, and all of a sudden I see him do a complete flip into the air. A complete flip. Uh, the shell had hit him, and it, the impact of the shell, it had gone through his canteen and into his hip, and it just flipped him into the air. And when he came up, he looked at me and he says, Buddy, which was my nickname, he says, Buddy, I think I've been shot. I said, Barry, I think you have been. And reached down and pulled him back to me, back to me, uh, to, to get him out of the, the line of fire that had taken him. So then we kept advancing through the village, and it was clear within a half hour that we had the village cleared. And then what started coming out of the huts that we had just advanced through were elderly men, women, children, by the scores, came out of their huts. And all of a sudden we're surrounded by civilians after we have chased a real live enemy out of this village. So here is, here is the problem. These are their homes that they're coming out of. They felt safe and secure in these thatch huts, straw huts. And they're coming out of their homes and looking at us with terror in their eyes. We're big, we got guns, we got helmets, and uh, they're, they're crying. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the order comes down to us on the right flank to start burning down the huts, start burning down these huts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I asked for the order to be repeated because that meant we were going to we were going to burn down the huts of, of homes where these people lived, and these people were not military targets. These people were innocent civilians mm -hmm. who happened to be in support of the Viet Cong. But should they also pay for this? And as far as we were concerned, and as I look mm -hmm. back at it today, this is just one incident in, in a mm -hmm. year and a half of Vietnam, but but. 
as I look back upon this today, that incident right there identified for me the conundrum presented to uh, military uh, uh, officials during the war. How do you how do you offensively take take out an enemy that's living among the civilian populace? How do you mm -hmm. do that? So I asked the orders to be repeated to burn down the huts, and and uh, the runner came back and said, "Burn the huts down." It came from the company commander, whose name was uh, Robert Stableford. And we were, in his judgment, we were burning down uh, military targets, mm -hmm. the huts where the Viet Cong had lived. Uh, we, so we burned them down. There happened to be a CBS camera crew that was not with, with my particular uh, uh, unit, but there happened to be a CBS camera crew uh, uh, that was uh, headed up by Morley Safer, a reporter. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Safer captured the, the pictures. Now he was separated, I might say this, he was separated from the action. He was not present when, when the fighting was taking place. He mm -hmm. was after the fact. He was after the fact. And so when he came in, he sees Marines burning down mm -hmm. sites. Mm -hmm. And so he films that. And then he, uh, he, he brought, uh, well, let me, I'm mm -hmm. getting ahead of myself. Um, he, um, Mr. Safer, presents his report, and that evening, uh, the company commander, Captain Stableford, comes to my, my uh, tent as we, we're back at the end of the day licking our wounds, and uh, comes to my tent and he said, uh, you were over on the right flank today? I said, yes, sir, I was. He says, well, Corporal, I'd like for you to come and be interviewed by Morley Safer. And there was something about this that I did not like, but one, orders from your commanding officer mm -hmm. are not negotiable. Mm -hmm. And so I went and here's Morley Safer, and he's got a camera, and it's him with a microphone. He sticks a microphone in my face. He says, isn't it true, when you hear that, isn't it true that, um, that uh, you were seeking revenge for the unit that was in there the month before, it killed a bunch of your buddies. You were seeking revenge, and that's why you burned the hut sites down. And I said, no, sir, that's not true. I said, what is true is that those were military targets, and we received orders to burn them down, and we did so. And uh, I was offended at the question, and he mm -hmm. could tell I was offended at the question because he didn't know from nothing about yeah. what we had involved, been involved with earlier. So that story ran August 5th. Of, of 1965 on national CBS News, Walter Cronkite News, and I was one of those interviewed, uh, and uh, Safer interviewed two other men, both of whom were killed in the war, as it turned out, and uh, in addition to myself, and uh, he um, uh, it received national attention, mm -hmm. international sure. attention, because you got Marines burning down huts, and, and the story was portrayed in a way that made us look like demons, mm -hmm. made us, instead of people who were given a difficult military task to handle. So right then, is, I, I, was, I was incredibly disappointed, would be a mild word at Morley Safer, but I also was, to use the word disconcerted by what I saw there. I, mm -hmm. I, did we feel good about burning down the homes of, of, uh, of people, civilians? No, we did not. And I, I can recall shortly thereafter, my unit was sent to an advanced French bunker, an old French bunker, to support uh, a, an artillery unit that was firing against the enemy. And the 105, our, this big artillery pieces, and we were, we were put on the flanks to support this artillery unit because it was an advanced position. At night, the, the artillery units, the 105, would start firing, firing. And it was called H and I fire, and I I asked, what does that mean? H and I. They say we're harassing and interdiction fire. So I went over to the battery commander, sergeant. I said, sergeant, what are your orders? And he said, corporal, my orders are to fire intermittently, all night long, into the black, out there where the enemy is at. I said, are you firing at specific military targets? of specific grid coordinates? He says, no, I'm just firing arbitrarily. Arbitrarily mm -hmm. is not the word he used. He says, but I, I'm just firing 
into the darkness to keep the enemy from advancing against it. I said, sir, sir, are you aware that people live out there? That you're firing into places where people could be living. These are their huts out there, are villages out there. And he says, Corporal, I have my orders, you have yours. And so right then I realized that, that we weren't going to win this war. We were not going to win a war where we were doing combat against people we were supposed to be fighting the war on behalf thereof. Mm -hmm. So then fast forward months and months later, continual operations like that, search and destroy missions, which we would, we would occasionally kill the enemy and the enemy would occasionally kill us. But civilians would be killed too in the mm -hmm, process. Mm -hmm. Civilians would inevitably and inexorably be killed in the process. So I was, I was, I, it is not my job to question our overall mission. That was political and that was, that was the political end of it was the President of the United States, Linda Baines Johnson, mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. But then there was the military side of it mm -hmm. and uh, we were following those orders from the civilian leadership. And it came down our way to our level that we had to execute those orders from people who had no idea really what we were confronting uh, because they were in Washington. And it seems like that hasn't changed. No, that hasn't changed a lot. But I'll leave that for mm -hmm. others to no. discuss, but it hasn't changed a lot, I, I agree. Did you, and did you sustain any injuries during this time? Uh, or No, I did, I did, I mean, was I personally wounded? No. I mean, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever I hear accounts of this, and I know it's naive, mm -hmm. but the fact that some can go through and, and you know, remain unscathed is amazing. <laughs> the wounds, the wounds that I suffered are right here, yeah. right here. Um, the, but I was, I was, we were in an advanced position in the jungle, way in the jungle, my unit. And I was, I was uh, given responsibility for doing reconnaissance patrols. Now my role mm -hmm. had changed from machine gun squad leader to doing reconnaissance, managing reconnaissance patrols, try to locate mm -hmm. the enemy. So that B-52s and and mm -hmm. uh, uh, long-range artillery could 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 eradicate them. So we're in a very advanced position, and a typical mission would be three weeks long. We'd mm -hmm. go out and essentially live off the countryside, and uh, it was it was tough work because you're leeches and snakes. I was going to uh, ask it's, you it's, about it's, it's the tough. critters. <laughs> this is tough. If you have uh, uh, an aversion to snakes. Vietnam would not be the place that you would ask to be sent to because yeah, uh, they not my favorite uh, uh, cobras and uh, and uh, vipers and the like. But aside from the snakes, they didn't. The snakes didn't have guns. The enemy did, and so mm -hmm. we were we were looking to to keep from being found out ourselves that we were mm -hmm. out there because it was in areas that the North Vietnamese were moving through, and so radio we, radio silence was broken and. Uh, I received a call uh, that a radio, a helicopter would be on its way to pick me up tomorrow morning. And we're in the mm -hmm. jungle. And I, I, I said, uh, they said, you, you'll have to find an open place. It was not an open place in the jungle. Mm -hmm. And the voice very cryptically came back and says, get an open place. So we, we formed a, we, we chopped down some trees mm -hmm. and formed a landing zone and, and a helicopter was sent to pick me up and my replacement was on the helicopter and I loaded up in the helicopter and um, the uh, the crew chief of the helicopter they were unforthcoming as to where we were going if they knew if they knew that the pilot and the co-pilot in this UH-1B Huey takes off and I have no idea where I'm going uh, is this just you? It's just me, and and my I, my troops were saying, "What's the deal?" I did not know. Uh, I, I knew I wasn't whatever it was 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 I didn't ask for, and uh, so I was taken to the bunker uh, in, in north of Da Nang of the commander of all Marines in South Vietnam. His name was Louis Walt. He was a major, two star. And I got off the helicopter, and the helicopter took off, and I'm standing there with my weapon, looking not very presentable. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, these people are rushing about, and they're all shaven, and they're all clean, and their boots are shined. And I'm thinking, this is, uh, this is new to me. And so an aide comes out, captain says, you're going to be interviewed, corporal. Again. Uh, <laughs> to, you're going to be interviewed as, as a candidate to... to to be the general's security leader. Uh, general Walt, we've decided to form a, a security uh, contingent for the general. 
and you're going to be in charge of that if you're selected. And I said, would I have any say in this matter, sir? He said, no, you don't have any say in this matter. So I was, I was taken into a room, and there's this huge man with two very bright stars sitting behind a desk, and he's got paperwork, and he's, he all of a sudden looks up and sees me standing there, and I am a mess. And they tried to take my weapon away when I went in to see him. They said, you got to leave your weapon out here. And I said, no, I'm not leaving my weapon. This weapon stays with me. And he sees that I've got my weapon with me. And he, he, he nods like he's a tough guy. Mm -hmm. he's a, General Walt was a tough guy. He says, he looked up at me and he says, you'll do. And so for the next several months, I'm his security leader. And we, we fly all over the northern part of South Vietnam. It's called i -Corps. Mm -hmm. And we visit strike force, uh, our special forces, fire bases, and we visit uh, military leaders of all commands in I Corps. And uh, I am with him almost every moment for seven months. Almost every Did moment. Did you ever find out how it was that they selected you for this? Or? I think what happened is, is I, I have thought about that. And I think what happened is, is a word came out to my company. My company mm -hmm. was thought of as being a very good company. Mm -hmm. Um, I, can, I can say that right. So, uh, and we were. And um, he, uh, I think what happened is, is word came out to my company, send somebody to be the general security leader. I mm -hmm. think that's what happened. And mm -hmm. the company commander said, well, let's get, let's get Hall. Let's, uh, and Hall's not here, sir. Hall's out there. They said, well, I don't mm -hmm. care. Get him. That's, that's how the things happen in the military, mm -hmm. as, um, as Keith Price knows, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Keith Price knows. <laughs> That's the way things happen in the military. So I was, uh, I was, I needed new uniforms. Sure. I needed, and I needed to select who would join me on this security team. And I, I selected the best men that I knew. Had a half dozen of us. And every time the general went any place, I was with him. And as the detail leader, when he was in a briefing with Westmoreland mm -hmm. or. Senator Javits or whoever I was there, mm. and the I, and looking back, uh, it was I. Uh, can I say also mm. that I hosted Anne Margaret and Joy Heatherton and uh, Bob Hope, and uh, they all came to visit troops. And mm -hmm. when they would come, they would come and stay at least one night with General Walton. He had very, very uh, sparse accommodations. He had an extra bedroom in his bunker, but it wasn't much, and. Um, uh, I'll never forget, Charlton Heston made an impression on me. Uh, he, he, he came out of his room one night and he says... Uh, Is this before or after he played Moses? <laughs> <laughs> but it's the only time I'd been asked this question in Vietnam. He came out and he had a toothbrush in his hand and a cup of, a canteen cup of water. And, uh, and Moses asked me, uh, is it safe to drink the water here? And I said, well, sir, we've been drinking the water here for a long time, and it's, it doesn't taste very good, but it's safe to drink it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Back, back to, to brushing his teeth. But Ann Margaret was, was, my, was a personal favorite. But at any rate, uh, I would be present when, when General Walt and General and their staffs, General mm -hmm. Westmoreland and their staffs, were, were talking. I, I, I can't ever remember not being there. And... Uh, and the first thing Westmoreland, General Westmoreland would ask would be about K KIAs. How many Im enemy did we kill? Uh, he, he would always want to know how much we killed. He, 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 I never heard him ask about the war and its mm -hmm. impact on the civilian populace. I never heard anything like that. Uh, and uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a dis it was disheartening, very disheartening mm -hmm. to hear General Walt only and he, he would speak to General Walt, who by the, by the way now was a three star. He was a lieutenant general. Okay. He was promoted when I was there, and so he. Uh, but he was. Uh, there were several private things that they discussed, which I've never written about nor never talked about. Uh, but really, Miss Westmoreland wanted to know more than anything else is, how many bodies have you got for me today? How many how many kills have you got for me today? And so that led to frankly inflated body counts. And, play, and, and that was another disheartening thing to see. Uh, I, one of my jobs was to take to General Walt every morning the casualties, the Marine casualties from the day before in I-Corps because they would be tabulated overnight and I would take them to him every morning.
mm -hmm. with one of his aides. And um, he would carefully look at them and he would try to, to discern patterns wherein the soldiers were killed in a, in a certain way by, by certain enemy uh, forces. And what a big thing with him was troops bunching up on the ground. He was convinced that if troops bunched up on the ground, and he was right, and if he, and if he hit, if they hit a, a mine, uh, which happened frequently, or if an artillery shell came in, a mortar shell came in, that, um, that more would be killed. So I, w there would be many occasions when we would be out f from above looking down on marine operations, mm -hmm. infantry operations against the enemy. And if he saw troops bunched up on the ground, he would order his helicopter to be landing and he would jump out of the helicopter with me racing along at his side, trying to keep him alive. And, uh, and he, would, he would say, who's in charge here? Who's in charge here? And some lieutenant would come over, sir, here, sir, I'm in charge. He says, if you want to stay in charge, you'll get these men spread out. So that was a big deal with him. But uh, so the war became to me uh, a joke. Uh, and it, it, well, I was wondering how your perspective was changing here from being in that combat unit to now right. being sort of pulled out and now you're attached to this, uh, you know, protect. I mean, obviously, clearly a different role and your perspective, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm, you're, you're coming at it from a different angle now. So. Well, I think that my role on his staff, which was, I mean, a very junior I'm a very junior NCO. I have no say in anything, but I'm a listener, and I listened, and it validated, it confirmed for me that which I thought was happening on the ground. Confirmed what you were already. And the the, the fact that we were to. attempting to win a war uh, on behalf of a people who did not want us there. Mm -hmm. The Vietnamese people would look at us with hatred in their eyes, and can you blame them? Mm -hmm. We were burning down their huts and firing artillery shells at them. I would hate that person too. And so it became clear to me, and I never said a word in opposition to the war, never to anybody, never intimated a word, uh, because I was in a command position and mm -hmm. I wasn't about to do that. Mm -hmm. But when I came home, when I came home after uh, Vietnam service and uh, completing my career as a drill instructor, I was a drill instructor at Marine Corps Recruit Depot in, in San Diego, California, mm -hmm. and a map instructor. Uh, and I finished up my Vietnam service, and then. So, did you finish your service in the service of this um, officer? No, it or? was it was at Marine Corps Recruit Depot where okay. I'd gone through recruit training as a drill instructor, and and then I was also a map instructor at Camp Pendleton. I would I had mm -hmm. both roles. Um, so I got out. So I, how long were you over in Vietnam then? Uh, uh, Fifteen months. Sixteen 15, months. Okay. Sixteen months. And then. Um, I um, went back to college and started a Vietnam Veterans Against the War chapter at my college. And we were not, by any stretch of the imagination, bomb throwers. We, mm -hmm. we were guys that, that marched in school parades mm -hmm. and, and with our slogans, Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And we had an active little chapter there and and we made students aware that the veterans some of the veterans that were coming back were in opposition to the war uh, and I to say that I was in opposition to the war would be an understatement I communicated with the president of the Vietnam veterans against the war at the time his name was John Kerry uh, later to become Secretary of I State. I was wondering if we're talking and, about uh, the same John Kerry. <laughs> and uh, John Kerry uh, I wrote him and asked him how to set up the local chapter and I still retain the correspondence that he sent me and how to set up the, the, uh, the local chapter and uh, I was appreciative of that then. But fast forward now, I make application to the FBI to join the FBI and I'm aware that there are people who are, uh, this is in the John Edgar Hoover era as mm -hmm. the director of the FBI. As I make application in 1970 to be a special agent in, in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And in the application that you fill out to become a special agent, hopefully, you fill out everything. You list everything. Nothing is left to chance. Mm -hmm. You list everything. So I had, I told the agent who had recruited me 
that I was a member of the Vi I was founded the Vietnam Veterans Against the War chapter, and that not necessarily something Director Hoover would support. I was going to wonder be, if how that went over. <laughs> but but um, it, he, uh, I don't think he ever saw my application. But the the agent thought it was it was honorable that I did so, and so he said put it on the application. And he says anything else, and I said well, I'm the president. Of, a, of an investment group of guys who have no money, but we, we, we meet a couple of times a month and we pool our resources and we invest in the stock market. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm, because I formed the group, I'm the, I'm the president. And he says, well, put that down. And the name of the group was Agiotodgers, which is Greek for investment or investor. And one of the guys came up with that. So I listed president of the Agiotodgers. Uh, and uh, the application was sent off. Question came back immediately. Not why was he against the Vietnam War? Why was he uh, the founder of a chapter of Vietnam Veterans Against the War? Why is he president of some group called the Agio Dodgers? <laughs> and, uh, he, because in the FBI you could not be a special agent and have private business connections, which okay. you can as the president of the United States, now we understand. Mm -hmm. But then uh, a special agent of the FBI could not have, absolutely could not have, private business connections of any kind. So I, um, I, the agent says, you got to get, you got to resign from agiotizers. So I resigned it, and, and the guys are all mad that I did, but I was no longer the president mm -hmm. of agiotizers. And then I had a long and, and, and very uh, enjoyable, fulfilling career in the FBI. I worked Sicilian organized crime all, all my career. Oh, wow. And uh, Las Vegas and New Orleans and, and uh, Chicago, Kansas City. Later, uh, after FBI service, went up on the Hill as chief investigator during the Ron Contra uh, hearings, uh, chief investigator, Keating Savings and Loan hearings. And I've had a good career. Now I've been in the private sector doing corporate <laughs> investigations since 1995. And I know you've also gotten yourself very involved in Civil War uh, battlefield preservation. I have. It's a way of cleansing myself in Vietnam. But you know, one thing I, I want, I, I don't want to leave out of this too, because before we sat down in here, you were talking about your, I think it was your great-grandfather who'd served in the Civil War, and his uh, sort of philosophy or position on, on, on duty. My great-grandfather uh, was a farmer in Neshoba County, Mississippi. And he was 21 years old at the outbreak of the Civil War. And he joined uh, a company called the Winston Guards, 13th Mississippi Infantry. And um, he, I think because he was older than the other candidates, they made him the sergeant of that company. And he went off to war and fought in every major battle of the Army of Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking, uh, we're talking Antietam and Fredericksburg and uh, uh, at Gettysburg, he's wounded on the second day, Gettysburg, uh, taken to prison, uh, where he escapes from prison, rejoins his unit in Gordonsville, Virginia, in 1864, uh, Barksdale's Brigade, Longstreet's Corps, and after the defeat of the Confederates, uh, he surrenders at Appomattox and walks home. And uh, his musket, uh, hangs on the wall in my house <laughs> and uh, so he um, he's he's a he was a hero to me as a boy uh, because my my, my great-grandfather fought like myself in a really bad cause mm -hmm. a really bad cause uh, he fought uh, on behalf of those who would sustain slavery and he was he did not own any slaves but that that was his side in the mm -hmm. war mm -hmm. uh, so he fought in a really bad cause I went to Vietnam served honorably as a sergeant, just like he was, and fought in a really bad cause. And we both came home, and became good citizens, contributive citizens. And I, I, I regret nothing. Just, I, was, I was fortunate to have served with wonderful men. Now you mentioned and regret that. regret those who were lost to us forever. You mentioned that you kept in contact with this, um, I can't remember his name now, this one that uh, you'd kept. Barry Hunter? Yes. That you've kept in contact. There are others you've kept in contact with. And yes, I have. Uh, but we, and I would say that of of 
that company, Delta Company, 1st Battalion, 9th mm -hmm. Marines, that came back, the survivors, and I, there were many losses in our service in Vietnam, many losses, but of the survivors that came back, um, all of these men that came back assimilated uh, very seamlessly mm -hmm. into society. They, they got jobs, they went to school, they went to law school, we've got bankers and lawyers uh, and FBI agents in, in, in that number. And they've, they've led wonderful lives. And none of them, to my knowledge, the, the suffer from psychiatric or psychological problems as a result of the Vietnam service. They've just put it behind them and gone on with their lives as they well should have done. They're, they're brave men, all of them. You know, one thing I'm just kind of curious about, because I know you were in the Marine Corps, what is the interaction with the other services? I'm because I mean I know the army. I mean they're they're all they were there. How does that work? What or is there much interaction? Is this is the army kind of doing their thing and the marines are doing their thing? And we had different. Uh, I just wonder how we had if there's tips, interaction. Uh, uh, to answer your question, whether we interacted with other services, yes, we did all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had different tactical areas of responsibility. Okay. Uh, the Marine Corps had was not in Saigon. We were not in the Mekong Delta. The Marine Corps was in the northern part of South Vietnam. Uh, da Nang would be the center mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. uh, to the highlands to the west. And we operated there. And within that area, the only soldiers, U.S. soldiers, were special forces. Okay. Uh, and they were special forces were running intelligence operations some of which we don't talk about even to this day, mm -hmm. and operating in places we don't talk about even to this day. But I would occasionally run into a SEAL unit uh, in Vietnam, would occasionally run into the gunboats, the swift boats, mm -hmm. operating up and down the rivers. But most part, it was, it was grunt work. We were infantry doing infantry work. And uh, it was, it was I, I guess the takeaway for me from Vietnam, the central takeaway, is our country can be wrong. Our mm -hmm. country can be badly wrong about committing our, our, our treasure, our, our young human treasure, mm -hmm. to a military cause that's unwinnable to begin with. And Vietnam was never unwinnable to begin with. It was never. And, you, and I could see that almost the first day I was there, that, that there was this huge contradiction between our mission and how we were going to accomplish that mission amongst mm. the civilian populace that didn't want us there to begin with. Mm. You know, we, uh, we frankly deserved the outcome that we got. We frankly deserved it. And I say this and it, it, it infuriates people, and, but I, it's something I believe. The 55,000 men, women mm. we lost in Vietnam, they died for nothing. They died for nothing. Because what, what, if, if we won something, what did we win? We won nothing mm -hmm. that we kept. And if you don't win a battlefield and keep the battlefield, then you lost the battle. And we lost the battle, and those men died for nothing. It pains me to say that, it pains yeah. me to think that, mm -hmm. but that's what I think. I believe that, and I, tragic. And I know that you have uh, been asked to speak different places and, and talks and whatnot, if you, we're in front of a group of young people, young men. Uh, would you encourage military service? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, I always tend to ask. Hopefully on behalf of good causes. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always uh, usually ask that question, and, and really without a fault, everyone we've mm -hmm. talked to has felt the same in terms of military service per se. Well, whatever, I think most, uh, I think Keith Price, other veterans would say the mm -hmm. same thing, that whatever we are today, we are as men as a result of that training and that service. It's made us who we are. Mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have accomplished anything had it not been for that military training, a discipline, order, because my life before that was chaotic <laughs> and poor, I might have had. <laughs> um, one thing I want to ask you about, too, we touched on it briefly, about your efforts with Civil War preservation. Mm -hmm. um, does some of that impetus from that clearly come from your, your grandfather and your own uh, honor? Because clearly in this area, Brandy Station uh, could have been a racetrack or something. It's not now. It's a mm -hmm. beautifully preserved battlefield. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the 
pursuit personally of battlefield preservation has given me the opportunity to pay homage and honor to young men of another generation, of another mm -hmm. era, who fought for what they believed in. That, to me, is the central driving ambition for why I work to preserve battlefield. When I walk onto a battlefield, it is, to me, truly sacred ground. It's, these battlefields are cemeteries. These guys are still buried there. Mm -hmm. Their blood was spilt all over this, this land around here, in Culpeper County particularly, Cedar Mountain, Brandy sure. Station, Kelly. So that I am able to help honor their service by saving their battlefields is, to me, the greatest legacy of my life's work. Well, it's very inspiring, <laughs> energizing. Thank you. So is there anything else that you'd like to share before we... Well, I thank you, for, thank you for the opportunity of telling oh, the story. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I Yours was the, one of the more vivid uh, descriptions. I found myself getting sucked into, I mean, the, the whole thing with the, the climate. It, my husband served in Vietnam. I mean, he talks about it, when, you know, it was hot and you're sweating and the critters. And I mean, it, just trying to imagine that um, scenario. I mean, I visited, uh, years ago, visited Thailand. And at one point, we were out on this river, and, and I was looking at the landscape, and that jungle was so thick. It was just so thick. And every once in a while, you'd see something moving, and I'd think, is that an animal, or is there just somebody on the shore or something? And then I thought about the whole thing with Vietnam. I thought, how on earth did they navigate this? Because, again, that mm -hmm. was just... I had, uh, a, in my unit in Vietnam, uh, a um, Cherokee Indian, and he had an Americanized name, which was not his given name, mm -hmm. of, of Robert Robertson, <laughs> and uh, and we called him Bob, and but he was straight off the reservation, and a wonderful machine gunner, a wonderful man, and he everything about Vietnam he took literally. You you've met people that. Whatever it is, it's literal to them. He, he, there's no nuance, it's literal. Mm -hmm. Well, he would hear a tiger off in the jungle at night. Oh! And Bob would say to me, Corporal, did you hear that? I'd say, yes, I heard that, Bob. You'll, you'll stay awake tonight, won't you, Bob? In other words, mm -hmm. don't go to sleep on watch. Mm -hmm. or he, he, one time, there was, a, uh, there was a bird in Vietnam. We never, ever saw the bird but we would hear it at night, and it would go, shh, shh, and it sounded like somebody telling somebody to be quiet. Mm -hmm. So Bob Robertson would come over to me and say, Corporal, did you hear that? I'd say, yes, Bob, I, I, I heard that, I heard that. And then next time, Vietnam had a bumblebee that was as big as your fist, and these bumblebees would fly around, and it'd get in your face and look at you, they didn't mean you any harm, but but uh, it was they would make a like, like a small helicopter, making mm -hmm. the sound, <laughs> and so they one of them went over and flew in front of Bob's face, and uh, he 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 said, Corporal, do you see that? This is a strange place, Corporal. <laughs> this is a very strange place. And I said, yes, Bob, but you'll go home to Oklahoma after this is over, mm -hmm. and uh, you'll have a good life and. He has, uh, but I, I'll tell you. One night, I have to tell the story. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's uh, it speaks to dedication. Mm -hmm. It speaks to courage. And this is my story, that more than any other speaks to to human courage in Vietnam. Uh, one night, the enemy had, was assaulting our advanced platoon position. They were assaulting the position. We had fifty men give or take, and they outnumbered us. But we had, fortunately, we had a little piece of high ground where we were able to shoot down plunging fire. And as they kept coming toward us, they were leaving people behind because we had shot them and we had killed them. And this was at night. And it seemed like they were going to make one last mad rush towards our advanced position. And I had a, a, a machine gunner from Chapel Hill, Texas, uh, by the name of Tony Turkowski. He was German, but his name sounds Polish, but he, he was German, from the German community mm -hmm. that you find in Texas. 
and it sounded like you could hear them out beyond our position marshalling their courage. You could hear them talking, and the, 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 the crescendo of their, their talking got louder, and you could hear ammunition, you could hear safeties being taken off, you could hear magazines being forced into, into weapons, and um, it appeared that they were going to come back, and our ammunition was just about gone. And I turned to Tony, and I had taken two M26 hand fragmentation grenades out, and I had placed them there, and that if they overrun our position, I was going to use those against ourselves. And so I, uh, I said to, to Tony, I said, Tony, it looks like this is this is it. I wasn't trying to be dramatic, mm -hmm. dramatic, but I said, "Looks like this is it." He says, "Corporal," f and they never came back. But he put his he put his face down against that. He was prepared to die. And so, that's I I shortened what he said because he said that pejorative word mm -hmm. in a sentence them and so to this day when I call him in Texas and he comes on the phone the way he knows it's me is I say the same thing <laughs> <laughs> so anyway we're both so, alive so so that would have <laughs> been that would have been your decision then if if they had that you would have had to in essence take out your own that unit there yeah rather I, than I would I would have pull those pins on those grenades. I would, rather than us being taken alive or shot by them, I was prepared to pull them. And yeah. Tony understood that. We mm -hmm. all, and his A-gunner was a black kid from Chicago, Jim Anthony. He was the only one of us that could be described as elegant. He was as elegant as he could be. Always smooth, just a very elegant guy. He now uh, is in Chicago and owns a string of shoe stores. And uh, so, Thank but you good men. Sure. Thank you for, I'm sorry that, that brought up yeah. painful memories. <laughs> well, wh what I was thinking of is there, there's a lot of guys didn't make it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and they also had that same commitment, and that same dedication. One last question. Did you ever go back? No. No. Oh, okay. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I often uh, wonder because some of no, those... No, <laughs> I have had, I've had people say, there's nothing, I mean, I just, can you go back on one of these tours? Mm -hmm. And my... Uh, I, it, it offends me that anybody goes, first mm -hmm. of all, and there's nothing there for me, mm -hmm. uh, nothing there that I, we lost. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go back and celebrate that, that uh, miserable performance. So, When you were talking about your service in the FBI, mm -hmm. would you mind giving me like a couple highlights? Could you do that? Sure. Well, I was, um, have you seen the movie Casino? That's mm -hmm. my case. And I could talk about that for days. But that's my case. Uh, Nick Pileggi, the, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. the, Remember who, who that. Who wrote and wrote Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. I admired his work in Goodfellas, and he made a pretty good movie out of it. So out of the blue, somebody in FBI Las Vegas gives him my phone number. I'm impressed that he has my phone number. And he calls me at my Middleburg place, and he says, I understand you're the man to talk to about straw man. Well, straw man was the name of the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, if you're interested, I'll tell you why the name of the case. So he, um, he says, can I talk with you about that? I'm going to do a script and, uh, and do a movie on that. And I said, Mr. Pelleggi, I said, I, I'm impressed that you have my phone number, and I thank you for your... your uh, your your offer, <laughs> I said. But I'll tell you what: if you write the director of the FBI, whose name is William H. Webster, if you write him, and he says it's okay, you have to write him personally though. It's okay to talk to you. I said I'll talk to you, and I'll tell you what I know. But he's got to approve it. And I thought no more about it. I told Deborah, my wife, I said, I just had a call from a guy who wants to do a movie. And I'll never hear from him again. <laughs> and so two weeks later, he calls me up 
and he's got a letter from William H. Webster, director of FBI, which came to me through the mails as well. He says, he says, I can talk to you. I said, I am impressed. So he came to Middleburg, Red Fox Tavern. He had a room. And I sat there with my wife, Deborah, and for three days, told him all about that case. And my wife was a journalist uh, and a good one. She, she, at the end of all of it, she says, I never knew any of that. And I said, we just don't talk about things like that. <laughs> Keith knows that better than I do. Mm. So um, we just don't talk about things like that. And so he wrote the, he wrote the, the, uh, he wrote the uh, uh, book, then wrote a script, sent it to me. And I said, it looks good. And I said, I'm just going to give you judicial notice. I'm, there's one thing I can't tell you. And so don't ask me the question, but there's one thing I absolutely cannot tell you. I said, because it's, it's live in a well. It's live in a well. And uh, so he does the film. They, mm -hmm. they asked me to come out during the filming in Las Vegas, and I paid my own way, and I meet Sharon Stone, which was worth the trip, price of admission. Meet Joe Pesci, meet Robert De Niro. And uh, uh, it was nice, it was fun. <laughs> and so the movie comes out, and the movie is 90% accurate. 95%. But when our source for that died, his name was Frank Rosenthal, and he was the character played by Robert De Niro. He was our source, our FBI source, my source. And when he dies, he owns a sports bar in Boca Raton. He dies. I called Nick up. I said, Nick, he's married to Sally Efron, who's since died of cancer. Mm -hmm. You remember Sleepless in Seattle? That was his wife wonderful person. So I went to New York to 81st and Madison to the Eat Diner, E-A-T. Nick sitting across the table from me. I says, Nick, remember I couldn't tell you something? I says, here it is. He's dead now. Frank Rosenthal was our informant. He says, does it change anything in the film? I says, other than that he was an FBI informant? No. Doesn't change anything. I was just curious how you met your wife. She interviewed me for a story. Oh, <laughs> That in itself is a nice story. That's great. She uh, was a she was a reporter for the Westerly Rhode Island Sun newspaper in Westerly Rhode Island, but she was the assistant editor of the Civil War News. Oh. And when in June of 1990, we had an event at Brandy Station. She was sent by the Civil War News to cover it, and she interviewed me on the front porch of Page and B's house in Brandy Station. And after that, I said, "Well, she's cute." And uh, then we had a, a conference, a, a Association of Preservation Civil War Sites Conference. Uh, she was there, and we had dinner. And then at the start, I asked her to marry me on the front steps of Farley. I don't know if I told you that. No, I didn't know On the front oh steps my, of Farley. Oh, my, that's sweet. Did you know at dinner that night? Yeah, I did. I did. She was, she was a smart, uh, Smith College, Phi Beta Kappa. Hell of a lot smarter than me. Hell of a lot. But a uh, wonderful... But she died in in uh, in, uh, two, in, uh, in October two thousand and eight. Sorry to hear that. Breast cancer. Never, and she was without sin, without sin, completely. Never had a vice in her life. Never told a lie in her life. Without sin. Struck by lightning. No history of family. Hmm. Yeah, cancer. And she dies. And uh, and as for me, I've been peripatetic ever since. Hope Thank this has been you. helpful. It's been very helpful mm -hmm. and inspiring. Thank you very much <laughs> for sharing. Well, we hope out there uh, with our viewers that you've enjoyed this interview today um, with Bud Hall. Look for more of them. You can go to the website on Culpeper Media Network, and they're up there, War Veterans, History of Our Heroes. Um, there's more to come, and again, thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.